Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Westlin and I am the GA in the grad school for student engagement. Um, thank you all for joining us for this Zoom workshop. I just want to quickly go over a few tips while in this meeting. Uh, first, please keep yourselves muted unless the presenter asks for people to unmute. Um, second, if you have any questions or you want to respond to a question that was posed, use the chat or unmute if that is what the, the, the presenter would like. Um, also, with the chat, you can privately chat with me or the presenter um, if there are any questions or if you wish to share with the group anonymously. So if you want to pose a question that have your name attached to it, um, you can do it that way. Or if you have any technical issues, um, free, please just privately chat with me. Um, lastly, I just wanted to thank you all for your time and for joining us. Um, today we are discussing copyright and um, fair use. And um, Wendy Hybe is our presenter. She's from Beta Library. I'll let her talk a little bit more about herself and we'll go on to the presentation. So thanks all again for joining us. Well, thank you, Daniel. Uh, I feel like I'm in the hands of um, the control tower at the airport. You, you make me feel safer doing, this is my first Zoom workshop, so I'm feeling a little, ooh, how's this gonna work? Can everybody hear me okay? Go ahead and log into the chat and say hello. Um, so welcome to the Copyright and Fair Use Workshop. I'm Wendy Hybe and I do social sciences um, um, re research assistance here at the, at the library, at Missioner Library, and um, hope to meet all of you in person. And maybe some of you, I may know some of you and not recognize you by your, your names. I, um, I have an old screen that doesn't have a camera affixed to it, so you'll just hear my voice. Um, I have to begin with the disclaimer that I'm, I'm not an attorney. So the content I provide today is informative and not intended to be legal advice. And um, I'm, I'm fine if people want to, you know, add questions to the chat and I'll try to get to some of them. I might not be able to get to all of them, but um, I'll be glad to follow up with you later too if there are questions that um, remain at the end that we're not able to get to. Um, Daniel, can you remember, remind me how I, how I do, um, how I project my um, PowerPoint? I can't remember what I do next. Yes, so you'll just click at the bottom where it says share, and it'll be yes. in the box. So oh, thank share. you. And then um, if you already have a presentation on your second slide. I do, thank okay. you for reminding me, yep. Thank you. Okay, can you see that screen now? Yes. Great. I will start the, the show then. Uh, so there you go. There's my uh, name. If you need to, it to spell my, say my, uh, my email address or something. It's Wendy Hybe and if you, if you know me, if you've seen me, I'm very tall. So I always say to people, it's high like tall, so they can remember how to spell my name with the H-I-G-H-B-Y. And I have this copyright notice to sort of be a good example to you. Um, Creative Commons is a really neat way to, to license your work. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then I have my disclaimer. We do have an attorney here on campus, Dan Satriana. And so um, he's the chief contact for violations related to this DMCA Act. Does anybody remember Napster? I don't even think Napster's around anymore, but um, this was a development that sort of caused, I think caught libraries into the business of dealing with copyright. We've also always had those notices by the copy machine. Um, that say, you know, sort of copy at your own risk, <laughs> more or less. But, you know, now the Xerox machine isn't the center of the library like it, it used to be in some ways. It's, of course, you know, the virtual world and all the online resources we have. 
And so um, the, the copyright law is always sort of a few steps behind the technology. But yeah, we, it's good to know that we have the general counsel here on campus and um, you, you are, you know, free to contact him and he could help you or give you referrals if you truly need um, expert legal advice. But you know how librarians are, they, they can tell you, uh, they can't tell you everything, but they can probably tell you where to look it up, so to speak. And so that's how um, we serve you in terms of your copyright needs. It's sort of like, you know, the doctors, these days, the doctors, um, you, you see the physician's assistant a lot more than you see the, the MD. Yeah, this is kind of the same idea. I used to be a paralegal and uh, I changed professions in my 30s and I really like doing education. But yeah, it's sort of like everything you do comes back around and comes in handy later. Okay, so today's agenda. Um, we're going to talk about motivation and stance toward copyright law and what our institutional policy is here and some basic definitions and some resources and uh, sort of the fact that what will serve you the best in my opinion is that you're sort of flexible and that you can think of think how advocates think so in other words how attorneys think but also be a sort of judge and try to be fair to all sides and that's sort of taking on the um the role of off the author and the and the user of information and this will make more sense as we go through the slides and anyway we'll talk about fair use and how to apply that and the teach act and guidelines and i'll probably ask you at some point if you're interested in talking more focusing more on how um copyright and fair use might apply to your dissertation. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in the middle because that'll kind of just determine which way we go in the presentation today. So why should you care? There's various motivations, ethical, legal, professional, personal, and the roles. That's kind of what I was hinting at a few minutes ago that um, you, you'll need to approach copyright as as an author, as a researcher, as a student, as a teacher, and you'll be on sort of both sides of the uh, aisle there because sometimes you'll be the researcher using someone else's work and you want to use it ethically. And then at other times, since you're here and involved in higher education, you're likely going to be creating um, information and knowledge to yourself and you'll want your knowledge to be used in an ethical manner. So yeah, I don't know. I. If you never dreamed you'd be dealing with copyright law, surprise, you, you are going to. And it's kind of, part of it is sort of a bootstraps, educate yourself um, enterprise, but hopefully I can give you a little help along the way. So um, I like Hobbes book. Um, I'll give you a bibliography later, but her name is Renee Hobbes and she's written a book called Copyright Clarity. And she's a real advocate for fair use and using it to be, a, uh, I think, a good teacher, a good academic. And so she talks about these three attitudes toward uh, copyright law. Sort of see no evil, don't want to know about it, and just sort of have this blanket idea that anything you do for educational purposes is going to be ethical. And it's, unfortunately, it's not that simple. Um, do what you do, want, you know, do inside the classroom, don't share publicly. Um, that's sort of half true, you know, if you have a secure system like Blackboard or Canvas, we use Canvas here. Um, you're, you're on the way, I mean, that's a good thing because that it limits access, but it doesn't cover everything. And then some people can be hyper compliant and be um, too rule bound and not use the the law to their advantage, which they should to a certain extent, um, because the free exchange of information is part of um, sort of what our system is based on, and we'll talk about that in a moment too. So um, I probably have tended to be the hyper-compliant type. So keep that in mind as I present. <laughs> so institutional policy. We have a board manual, and the date on this one is February 14th, 2018. They may have revised it again. They're, they're tinker, tinkering with it often. So, and but believe it or not, 
it has copyright law compliance in it. And here's what that fine print says. All employees of the university shall conduct their activities on behalf of the university, including but not limited to any research or writing activities in such a fashion so as to meet and comply with all requirements of the United States copyright laws. And as a condition of employment, each employee agrees to accept responsibility for reading and understanding the requirements of the copyright law and the policy statement and guidelines of the university and for complying with those requirements and guidelines. So, yeah, I'm guessing there's several of us here on the call today that get a paycheck for the university and we are bound by this then. But the student code of contact, code of conduct also, um, while it's not as specific as the, the board policy manual, it does refer to um, following law. It emphasizes plagiarism. And plagiarism, you know, is, is related to what we're talking about today, but we, we won't be talking about it. Um, it's, you know, mostly about uh, giving proper citation and being conscious of how you're using the information, but it's, it's kind of, uh, it's not as involved, of course, as what we'll be talking about today. So if we were in a classroom, I'd probably have you share with each other in pairs. But just think about this um, on your own. Sort of what, what roles do you see yourself playing right now? What is your uh, as stance toward copyright law? Would you tend to be the close the door type, the sort of blanket, it's all educational use? Or would you be like me and be sort of rule bound? So this, this part is probably my favorite part of the presentation. It's the, the fact that the, the history of it and that copyright's in the Constitution. So you see our venerable document there. And this is where um, the copyright law originates. Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Sort of gets the heart beating, see the flag waving. Yeah, I, I like this. I like to think that I'm promoting the progress of science and useful arts. I'll bet you guys do too. So now to the nitty gritty, here's the definition. It's the exclusive legal right granted for a specified period, period, the author's life plus 70 years, to print, publish, perform, film, or record original material. But yeah, this is why you want to impress upon your heirs. See, when you get to be my age, you think about this stuff. You, you, when you get up there in years, you want to impress upon them to, um, what, you know, renew the copyright to your dissertation or whatever <laughs> when you get up there in years. Oh. So, the holder of copyright has the right to publish and distribute a work in print or other media, to reproduce it, to prepare derivative works. So, you know, that happens. People's work gets translated, becomes internationally important, to perform or publicly display the work, and to authorize others to exercise any of the above rights. So, that's what you'll do when you get your dissertation published in the ProQuest database is you'll authorize them to do that. You'll retain your copyright, but you'll authorize them to do it. And then with some publishers, they ask you to uh, give the copyright to them. Um, and some of them ask you to do that permanently. So you really need to read your publication agreements, keep your agreements and uh, don't, don't throw them away. Make sure you keep a print copy and are aware of what your rights are and make sure you negotiate your rights to, to your advantage. Here's uh, the copyright website of the US government. It's a great site. It's really helpful, really user friendly. That's why I put the URL in big letters there. 
and uh, that it's it's part of the uh, whole Library of Congress. So it's very wedded to li library um, related functions in our federal government. And then this is one of the um, brochures they have. It's, it's a nice overview of the basics. And then there are statutes and guidelines about this concept of fair use. And today we'll be focusing mostly on the statutes because they're the things that really carry um, weight. The guidelines are not as um, definitive and they're not as useful to you. So we'll be focusing more on those statutes. So fair use, what I keep throwing this around and I haven't defined it yet, so I'm finally gonna define it for you. Um, the use of a copyrighted work, including such use by reproduction in copies or phono records, so that you can tell this was written a while ago, can't you? Uh, phono records, or by any other means specified for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, including multiple copies for classroom use, scholarship, or research and it's not an infringement of copyright. So people lobbied long and hard to make sure that this was in the law because they knew it was important for educators. So this is where people get the impression that anything educational is okay. And it is veering toward that, but it has some caveats, so. This is where your judgment comes in, so why we have to do a whole workshop on this is because we have this wonderful privilege of balancing these four factors of fair use. So in determining whether the use made of a work in any particular case is a fair use, the factors to be considered shall include the purpose and character of the use, including whether such use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the whole and the effect of the use upon the potential market for or the value of the copyrighted work. So just take a deep breath and know that you don't have to memorize that because it is referred to in other places and you have this guide to help you. So I'm there to help you. There's my mugshot. And this is our library guide to copyright. So probably if you don't write down any URL today, I'd probably recommend you write this one down. And it, you can link to it from our library homepage. Um, we have the research guides link on our library's landing page, you know, our homepage. It's just, you know, to the right and it's the research guide link. And you've, hopefully you've looked at these guides because we have one for every subject. So hopefully you've already seen the guides and you know what this is, but if not, it should be a pleasant surprise for you. So everybody steer that one into your memories. And then this guide is very helpful for particularly finding uh, images and sounds and um, finding some that are um, perhaps uh, free to use that don't have copyright restrictions or um, it also helps you with the copyright related issues because you know different media have sort of different um, implications as far as copyright goes. There's a lot of restrictions around documentary film that that you know is text is not as controlled as some other types of media so um, yeah it's it can get complicated but anyway this is Stephanie uh, Wiegand's guide that was really ha helpful okay do you remember I talked about those range of stances toward copyright um, you know the, the let, let, let anything goes or be really careful and follow all the rules and because it is a complicated issue and this is just an, uh, a CQ researcher about 
copyright clashes. So if you're really interested in copyright, I recommend this. Um, and then there's something called communities of practice. And these are aff affiliate groups of people who are, have affiliated to deal with the issue of copyright. And this one, I'm looking for my cheat sheet to see what, what STM stands for. It's Scientific, Medical, and Technical Publishers. So they've gotten together to come up with sort of standards that they'd like to see their folks follow. follow. And then there are um, other folks. Um, well, I'll show you the example in a moment. I have an example, I think, from the College Art Association. Um, but oh, this is a little commercial for my bibliography that I'll give you later. Um, and advocates and communities of practice are on that and, uh, and other things. And so, yeah, I have a, I guess I put this here for the website particularly, if this um, community of practice idea appeals to you, you can go look at these codes of best practices um, and it'll make sense when I show you the next slide. So here's one from the College Art Association. Um, in other words, people who teach art encounter these, this issue of copyright a lot, as you can imagine, because they're reproducing artworks to teach their students and they want to do that in an ethical manner. And so their professional association has come up with some guidelines to help their practitioners. And libraries have done the same thing. Um, not surprisingly, um, it's just certain professions are much better and ahead in this game than others. And I found that, you know, like documentary filmmakers have weighed in on this, um, artists, yeah. um, music, the music library association. So a lot more things, I would say things, uh, more professions that are associated with media have, have and create, creative arts probably have weighed on this, weighed in on this than other professions. Um, here's some guidelines from that scientific medical and technical publishers group. So they've sort of come up with these really prescriptive uh, guidelines. The fair use factors allow a lot more gray area than something like this. So, but this is something that publishers probably would prefer. And it, it's not surprising because I think in business, um, there's just the desire for more predictability. But why the fair use um, law is so great is that it allow, allows you to tell a story, to explain your side, your context, and to make a case for why you need to use something for, your, for teaching your class or for, um, you know, presenting the, a, you know, doing a good job on a book or an article or whatever you want to use small portions of someone's work um, to be able to t teach well, to write well, to give context. So as this is just kind of a summary of those factors again, the purpose and character of the use, the why, why are you using it? Um, what are you using? What, what is it about the nature of the work that, um, helps you with the law and then the proportion and the, and the effect on the market. And this will make sense when we apply it to something and we will do that momentarily. So yeah, it's just, if you like critical thinking, this you'll find this interesting. If you're sort of an analytical type person, you'll think like, this is fun. And you can tell by the tone of my voice, I am like that. I am nerdy like that. So I like this quote. Fair use requires that people think. This is uh, Carrie Russell, who's a advocate and lobbyist who works for the American Library Association. And here's a, a case that influenced um, fair use recently. So that's why another reason why fair use is so nebulous in one sense, but is very adaptable, which is sort of the upside of that, is that. Um, it's constantly being changed by case law. So there could be a new case that begins tomorrow, you know, someone 
decides to sue someone and eventually when that case is decided often years later it will influence what you can or cannot do but it's the type this is a type of law that just it's changes because it's it's based on case law that's why you know jobs is job security for attorneys right and judges yeah okay so with that case the ju the judge said that the the uh, court district court erred in setting this particular benchmark so in other words being very prescriptive and the court thought that the analysis needed to be contextual and and take into account all these factors so it really argued in favor of, of you know using the fair use in a an expansive way i would say in an ethical but expansive way and so we'll do a group exercise and um, you can go to these websites if you want i have screenshots of the website as well so you don't have to go to these other um screen you know these these urls if you don't if you don't care to but if you're you know able to do that if and also watch the screen please feel free depends on whether you feel like multitasking i guess on what your um your technical limitations are in terms of your screens and so forth but um these are two really great tools one's at the university of minnesota and the other's part of the uh, american library association website so what these tools are are ways to um cover your bases in other words you need to make a record of what your thought process was when you claim fair use and um you probably won't need to have the need to do this for for minor things but um when you really have to think through um something you know for first probably for a publication and that sort of thing something that really has consequences you really will want to document your thought process because that will help you if there is or ever is a problem and most likely there won't be but this is the do kind of docu documentation you need to, to use um, to show that you went through a, a diligent process so yeah it's exciting to think yes you, you might be up on the witness stand showing your um, little pdf here that you got <laughs> when you evaluated fair use hopefully not but um you you'll have to think through how risk averse you are too when when uh it comes to this type of thing so you're welcome to go to those sites or we'll just talk it through and i have screenshots too so i have a example for us to work through together and let's say you're teaching a class and you want your students to read chapter nine of this book and you think well i'll just copy you know i want to really make sure they read it and uh, you're thinking oh well i could put it on reserve at the library but maybe i could just copy it and put it onto canvas or whatever um all right so you want to copy chapter nine you're going to have to weigh the four factors and this is the one site the university of minnesota site that helps you think through fair use and the other site is looks a lot like this as well and it gives you a, a nice framework in which to uh, do your analysis and shows you what favors and does not favor fair use so i'll click on the next one there we go so the purpose and character of your use this will apply um, this is pretty straightforward and pretty easy this is one of the easiest ones to figure out so your use is educational unc is nonprofit. you know if you end up going to work for a for-profit university that will change the balance a little bit for you but anyway for for most folks i think most well not most institutions are either not for profit or non-profit but you may work for profit making 
it's too slow. So you'll, you'll have to think about that in the future. But anyway, for the purposes of this exercise, we'll say we're, we're here at UNC. And we're not going to do any transform. I don't think we're going to do a par parody of a book about classism in, in the social, in, was it in the social profession, social work profession? Anyway, but yeah, the commercial activity would f be against fair use. And if you're going to make a profit, you're going to sell this chapter to your students. But yeah, you're not, so. And then, you know, the one you saw one of the things mentioned was transformative use. So this is going to happen more often in the art, the realm of the arts. Not so much in the social sciences or behavioral sciences. Okay, then the nature of the work. So published work and factual or nonfiction favors fair use. Against fair use, something that's not published and something that's fiction. So it, this seems to uh, protect, this protects a lot of poets out there, I guess. I, I like to write poetry and I, I wish it paid better. <laughs> okay, factor three, the amount used. This one is, it can, can be kind of tricky and uh, you really do feel like you're, you're weighing this, the scales of justice on this one. I do anyway. Um, so for a small excerpt is more favored. Being really careful and precise, you know, not using more than you need. The entire work or proportionally large extra extract. So we're talking about, in this case, one chapter out of 10, 28 page pages out of the 299. That, that's not, you know, not a bad ratio, I don't think. I, I think it would tip our scale toward the favoring of fair use. And then the effect on the potential market. So this is where you want to find out, you know, is it still in print? Is it, can you still buy the book on the used book market? You know, is it, is the second edition out? In other words, if, if the second edition of this book were already out and you wanted to use chapter from the first edition and it's, you know, it's no longer in print and the authors are making, you know, and the publisher or whomever are making money off the second edition, that I think would favor your use of the first edition because you're not affecting the market. One time use, yeah, say you just, use this semester after semester, um, then I would think maybe, you know, you should be getting permission or, or looking at some of the other alternatives. So that, that makes a difference too. Is the, is the work, you know, marketed to, specifically to be a consumable or to, you know, to the classroom? It's, you know, would your, would your use, you know, if you were going to maybe have them read half the book, you know, the, it could be, you know, an argument could be made, well, that should maybe, should maybe be, you know, the, the textbook for the class. It should be bought at the bookstore, that sort of thing. So you, you kind of make your verdict on that form, and then you can get a report sent to your email address or produce the PDF. So it's a handy, handy tool. So, and there are, all, there are alternatives to fair use. Um, you can provide a link to something to which the library subscribes. So that's all, always the, the safest way to go. Maybe, you know, we have the, we have the e-book in the library and you could pr provide the students a link to that chapter. You know, uh, and with articles, it's even more, you know, more, you, we're likely to have a subscription to most things that you'd be wanting your students to read. So you can just provide a link to, for them. And you don't even have to worry about fair use or making copies or is it okay to make copies. Then there are open educational resources out there in the public domain. And here's that Creative Commons. Again, yeah, if you see a Creative Commons license, it's going to be, it's likely going to be um, uh, out there for, for you to use freely just to follow the, the guidelines that should be obvious, you know, people want, it may say, no, you can't use it 
freely unless it's for non-commercial use, that sort of structure, but those licenses should be very easy to interpret. Um, and yeah, there are just more and more uh, open textbooks out there um, and a lot of other open resources because people are, um, I guess, reacting to the high cost of textbooks and trying to keep the cost of education down for our students. So there's a whole, a whole world of resources out there. And, uh, you know, we at the library are happy to just tell you more about that. And then library reserve and we, we um, are glad to handle the copyright vetting for you. And here's our guidelines. So if you need to do that, if you're a teaching assistant or when you start teaching, yeah, be sure to lean on the library and they should be able to help you with reserves and copyright issues. And there's this whole world out there for dealing with this. And there's a copyright clearance center, which uh, collects royalties for on behalf of authors and publishers. So that's one way to deal with this. And the fees are, you know, usually fairly small and reasonable. And then there are course packs and the bookstore would be glad to help you with course packs. So if you wanted a whole compilation of readings and that's a good idea when you're doing something like that or when you're using things repeatedly semester after semester, you know, then these are the really ethical ways to go with that. And then the library has licenses some of our um, databases or many of them. So what our license might trump any type of copyright law. So for instance, the articles we have in the psych info and psych articles um, products, those are you know produced by the American Psychological Association. Um, they allow some of this um, reprinting and course packs and so forth. So you could look into that if you're doing, you're, if you're wanting to use some of those resources that we license. And for video, there are, we have, we're getting more and more streaming video now. And you can always ask permission. And that's probably a lot of what you'll be doing for your dissertations is, and when you, and if you're using proprietary uh, tests or measures, you know, if you decide to use this, a test that someone else, you know, originated and developed, you'll be needing to contact them and get permission to use it. You know, if it's not one you purchase, purchase commercially, you often will need to get the permission of the test author. And, you know, if you're reproducing a chart or graph, um, you often you need to ask permission for that type of thing. And APA, the American Psychological Association, has a form right on their website. So it's already drafted. So as, as I said, there are, uh, are all these um, doctrine statutes that have that carry quite a, the force of law with them and then these guidelines. And uh, the guidelines were developed in 76. And you don't, I'd say pretty much stay away from them. What there's these guideline charts that sort of hover, live forever on the internet and they distort educators understanding of the law according to Hobbes. And they're very prescriptive. You can see where they're talking about an exact number of words and so forth. And she really says, don't use them. So in other words, I think this says it better than what I've been saying. The guidelines are interpretive, not statutory. And so spontaneity, brevity, cumulative effect, kind of we danced around those principles with the fair use but um these you can see how specific they are and so they really tie your hands more than um they have to be and i would suggest the fair use gives you more leeway and i won't linger long on these multimedia guidelines it's much the same story 
So if the guidelines don't permit a projected use, you can fall back on the four factors. So you can look at both and see which gives you the best outcome. That's a, that's a nice way to, you know, to use it to your advantage. Let me see how we're doing on time. I don't think we'll go to these because we're sort of time, but if you like Stephen Colbert, this is a fun video where he talks. Remember in his old show, he had lots of guests, lots of authors, and this is one memorable one about copyright with Lawrence Lessig. And then this one about Disney. Disney is known for being very strict about copyright. And this is a really fun um, video on YouTube. So here's some guidelines about AV, but I will not spend too much more time on that. Um, this is about using it in a face-to-face -face classroom. Um, and it gives educators an exception because yeah, motion picture makers were really wanted to clamp down on this type of thing, but the lawmakers made sure that there were exceptions built in for educators, which is great. And you just have to think it through and just make sure that you're using the film for educational purposes and you're only using what the parts you need and it's a legally acquired copy and so forth. So it's pretty straightforward. Then there's the TEACH Act, which relates to teaching with tools like Canvas, Blackboard, and so forth. And this is where the protections in those um, systems help us because they require logins and so forth. So that's half the battle is the fact that it's only open to students enrolled in the class. So that helps you with um, complying with the TEACH Act. And so it is pretty specific when it comes to documentaries, use only limited portions of them. So you really have to analyze if you're using too much or just the right amount or too little. And there's a whole checklist related to the TEACH Act and I won't linger long on these because there's a tool you can use so this is another one and it's on the ALA site and it lets you click through and analyze is your use compliant, compliant with the TEACH Act. So with all of these rules and laws, if you're kind of feeling freaked out, how can I do this? I'm not a lawyer. Is my, you know, you're feeling kind of bound up by all this. Don't feel that way. In, I will just reassure you in my non-attorney opinion, but I would say that usually the worst case scenario is someone says, you know, just quit using my whatever, um, please take it down off the web. That sort of thing is a takedown letter. And so you comply or you don't, but that's usually the worst case scenario. Um, the copyright clearance fee could be somewhat pricey, but usually those are pretty reasonable. Um, best case scenario is you ask permission or you negotiate with the person and they're flattered and say yes. Um, or, you know, fair use applies and or the resource is already openly accessible because of someone out of the generous heart they have wants people to use their um, materials. So, and I just think of it very pragmatically and sort of holistically and then it becomes interesting I think and not so scary and not so annoying either. So the, the model, the copyright model is successful when the rights of users of information are unbalanced with the rights of authors, creators, or other copyright holders. So yeah, I think if you're able to do that, put yourself in all those roles, um, it becomes a much easier process. Now, um, here's advice for when you become an author. We have a journal publication guide. Um, choose your publisher with care. 
make sure it's a reputable publisher. Um, ask us here at the library. We love to help you with finding journal venues in which to publish. Um, be sure to negotiate for your rights to post your work, to share it, to use it for teaching in the future. Consider the Creative Commons licensing, as I mentioned, and also the Spark Addendum for authors. And keep copies of your emails and signed agreements. And then I have this, and I can go, I can switch over to um, some more information about how copyright affects you and your dissertation. I'm guessing that might be of interest. Do people want to get on the chat and say if they're interested in looking at that for a few minutes? Okay, it looks like folks are definitely interested in that. And so Catalina, let's see, do you have to sign in with that school to be able to get into that first link? Which link are you referring to? Go ahead and tell me in the, in the chat and I'll look at that momentarily. So Let's see. Okay, yeah, the University of Minnesota. No, it shouldn't restrict you. It should just be open. Um, if for some reason you're having trouble with it, you could use the American Library Association one, the Library Net one. But yeah, it uh, every I've never had it block me. I think it's open to the public. Yeah, to anyone. So, let's see, Daniel. Do I need to stop share and do new share since I opened up a new PowerPoint? Are you trying to show the web page or? No, I just closed. I so I shut down my other PowerPoint and I just, I want to show my uh, other PowerPoint. So am I still sharing my screen too? Does it, do you yeah. see? You I see, see the making, making, yeah. Oh, great. Okay, then that's, yeah, that's what I want to show everybody next. So I will start that show. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So this I'm using Jane, part of this is Jane Monson's slide, slides, and um, she's a good person to, for you to know, Jane Monson, uh, M-O-N-S-O-N, and she um, is an expert on our digital repository here. So when you, um, write your dissertation, you'll be depositing into it in, in two places. So we, you'll be putting it into the ProQuest database, but you'll also be putting it in the library's digital repository. So two venues that your fine work will show up in. So and I'm guessing that you, many of you have already used the ProQuest dissertation database because you're looking at, at it to see what are your peers researching in your area. And if you haven't looked at it yet, you will soon, no doubt. And so then we have our own local digital repository here at UNC. And often when you're doing research on Google Scholar and you see you get a link to an article or gray literature or a dissertation or whatever that doesn't go to a commercial publisher, often it's going to uh, these institutional repositories that 
that various universities have and we're one of those among many so this tells you a little bit more about ProQuest that it's the biggest collection of dissertations around the world and let's see it allows for limited access to your work at no cost so what they do is they show you know an abstract they, of your work but then if they subscribe to it then of course their their, subscri their subscribers can get to the full text and then our repository and many institutional repositories are totally open and free so but you do have some controls over this you're allowed to have an embargo if you want and i'll take, talk about that in a moment but right here this slide um this sort of defines what open access is and you know you can imagine librarians like this concept because we like people to have access to all this information but it 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 sort of disseminates your knowledge and it works toward the greater good the progress of science and the applied arts you remember that constitutional language but and it gives more impact to your work too but some people um, prefer to have embargoes anyway the um, ProQuest does have this open access uh, option on their um, list of choices that you'll have to make but we recommend probably and it's up to you we recommend probably not paying that 150 dollars fee because your dissertation will be open by default on our repository so the there will be a way for scholars to get to the to the open uh, version without paying uh, proquest fees um, with both uh, venues, you you are retaining your copyright. You're granting to ProQuest and UNC just a non-exclusive right to distribute your work. So, in other words, you are able to do what you want, what you want with it, at, you know, as, from that time forward. So, you can take parts of it and put it, you know, create a journal article or you know some people publish books and so forth now if you were to take your dissertation and publish it parts of it in a journal before you publish it in ProQuest that's a whole another uh, situation because you need to watch out and be careful about what you sign with the journal publishers before the fact but if if you haven't you know, if you're publishing the dissertation material for the first time with ProQuest and with our um, repository, you don't have to worry about that. Okay, I kept jumping to embargoes. So you may wish to delay release of your dissertation. And some people feel that gives them a better chance of publishing with a journal or book publisher. Um, that's something that you and your advisor should probably discuss and think about and you are able to suppress your man, your full text from public view then for one of these time periods and then there's a whole um, process of, to submit online and upload to ProQuest and same with our repository and this is uh jane on the last bullet point saying she would upload for you if you're writing a capstone and of course there's forms uh no not another form i know that's one reason i could tell you a secret one reason why i'm not uh, paralegal anymore because it felt like paper made the world go around but it still does no matter where you work you can't get away from it so here's my section that um, some of this I'll go through quickly because it will reiterate what we've done before but 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, this is the part, I forget to do this, but it's like, you're going to be an author. I get excited about that. And, but often when you're about to become an author, you're like really tired because you've finally done all this work. And so that's why we try to catch you earlier to get you to learn about copyright before the very end, because it's better if you know about it a little bit earlier and can think about it and explore and learn about it before the last minute. So, and I always like to think of the etymology that coffee comes from copious, which means abundance, and encourage people to share their, self, their work with the world, so. And yeah, I just like to emphasize this because I want people not to be intimidated by legalese and to really be selfish at this point and think about what are the rights you will want to retain because this could affect you for years and it will. It's very important. So then in, on the other side, you will be using likely be using excerpts of other scholars' works in your dissertation and journal article and so forth. So you have to think about what is a fair use of those scholars' works in your work. And so there's the public domain, things that are able to be used without any strictures, those that you can think through fair use on, and then somewhere you will need to get permission, express permission. And there's that quote again, you've seen it already. And as I said before, you grant ProQuest non-exclusive rights. And so one thing you do when you submit your dissertation to ProQuest is you verify that you've, received, that you've gone out and gotten all the necessary permissions that you need to for you know that test that you're reproducing or that picture that you're reproducing or that chart you're reproducing or that whatever yeah something that is of such you know proportion and impact and so forth that it doesn't um, fall under fair use or you will need to document that you you've gone through the fair fair use process with it it depends on um, what you, what we're talking about it's it's contextual but um so you'll be doing that and um oh in the bibliography uh, the best thing you can do is read a uh, copyright and your dissertation or thesis booklet by kenneth cruz and i will give you that citation at the end because it's the most important book that you can read for understanding more about your dissertation and copyright. Um, so you, you'll, one of the choices you'll have to make is, do I want to register my copyright myself or let ProQuest do it? And do I want a Creative Commons license or a standard license? So it's a little bit more money to let ProQuest do it, but you know, you have to kind of think about your time. You know, it might take, a f and, you know, an hour of your time I would think is it worth, you know, just having ProQuest do it for you. It might be. And then you can decide to do the Creative Commons licensing, which is a way to make your work, um, your copyright, you know, uh, restrictions very transparent and very, uh, it it's also makes you very um, cosmopolitan international because it's, it's an international system, so it will be recognized by folks with all, you know, all over the, the uh, world. They'll understand what your restrictions are. And then some things may be in the public domain, and there are tools to help you determine what is in the domain that you don't have to worry about, uh, and you can reproduce it freely. And then there's, again, asking permission. And you may have to, you may be in the weird position of asking for permission to reuse your own work if you have 
signed away your rights at some point. So if you want to use something that you published previously, you're going to have to look at your old publication agreement and see, did I sign my rights away? And then you'll have to ask the publisher for permission, depending on, you know, whether it's, it falls under. You may have a fair, you know, a fair use argument and not have to do that. But if it's a significant portion, of course, you may have to do that with your publisher. And I, there's the copyright is dealt with in your dissertation manual. And I sort of note it here. Um, fair use is mentioned and this previous publication issue is mentioned on page seven and whether to do the self or ProQuest registration on page 14. Now, technically you don't have to, you don't have to register it because copyright vests when you create something and save it so it's in, oh, what is the term? Let me look at the, the exact term. Copyright protects original works that are fixed in some medium. And basically that means storing it digitally for us in this era. Okay, this is what I wanted to make sure you saw and it's 5.03, so those of you that only have an hour, I want to be respectful of your time and say, um, well, that these are important sites. And I would say, yeah, there's the UNC copyright guide that I was saying that was the most important URL for you today. And I would say those of you interested in this issue of dissertations and copyright, this Kenneth Cruz booklet, this last URL, on this slide is probably my second highest recommendation for you to look at his booklet. He's a great, um, a great attorney and very, um, his, he's a clear uh, cogent writer. And this um, booklet is called Copyright in Your Dissertation or Thesis, Ownership, Fair Use, and Your Rights and Responsibilities. And let's see how many pages it is. It's, I told you it was cogent, and it is because it's only 19 pages, which isn't bad for a booklet that really covers the fundamentals of copyright for dissertations and talks about whether you should register your copyright and the scope of copyright protection and the public domain. and how fair use applies. And he gives lots of good examples. So we're getting close to the end. Oh yes, this sort of repeats what I've said already. So yeah, negotiate, negotiate, consider these other options and keep copies of emails and signed agreements. And here's some tools that can help you. So do we have time for a few questions? Daniel, my air traffic controller, what say you? Yeah, definitely. Great, okay. So should I press stop share? If that's what you want, yeah. Okay. So, all right, let me look at your questions. Yeah, I believe I'm looking at uh, Lauren's question, ProQuest and UNC Libraries Digital Repository are optional for capstones such as an MA thesis. I believe so. Are there any oddities to enter public domain? Hmm. Well, yes, there are. <laughs> and um, it probably will make more sense when you look at Kevin, or, or I'm sorry, Kenneth Cruz's um, booklet. 
because he has a uh, how many pages on public domain? One, two, three, about three, three and a half pages on public domain. Because yes, there are oddities. Um, usually, but I'll give you a few overall principles that will help. Um, usually government documents are in the public domain, but you always want to make sure. But yeah, often because, you know, they're created with tax dollars and they're meant for the, the people. Um, and that's often true of state documents as well. Um, so that's sort of a rule of thumb, but you can always um, check with, um, you know, ask, ask their, um, contact folks, you know, is this in the public domain, but it's going to be, I think in, you know, nine times out of 10, it's going to be the case for government documents. So that's a good thing. Um, let's see. With public domain, a lot of it depends on when the work was created. So yeah, that gets tricky. Like if, and we talked about the life of the author plus 70 years when I was teasing about your, you telling your relatives to renew your copyright after you're long gone. Um, so there's copyright sliders that help you look at the time periods because there are some works that have different time frames because of odd ways that the, that the statutes were written. So Basically, I'm trying to think if there's a rule of thumb. Well, works, works that are 19, that were produced in older, that before 1923 are generally in the public domain unless, you know, heirs have renewed them. So that's one rule of thumb. But you really need to use the, the slider tool that's on that um, ALA website. Um, but anything that was published before 1923, copyright has expired unless um, the you know heirs have renewed the copyright. But yeah, so oh, there's a chart. I'm looking on page 14 of Kenneth Crew's book, but that um, works created before 1978 but not published. The life of the author plus 70 years. Yeah, you really need to look at the chart. So yes, public domain law is unfortunately very odd. Any other questions? I'll wait for you guys to think about it. And, um, and often questions don't come up till they come up, right? So I want you to remember that I'm your contact person for this and I'm glad to answer questions that you send me via email or call me up or stop by my office. Um, if you're a campus person, uh, my office is in the southwest corner of the main floor of Missioner Library, number 108. It's the corner closest to the stadium. And if you're a distance student, well, I like getting emails and I love figuring out puzzles. So I'll be glad to help you that way. Or my phone number is 970-351-1530. And I'm available that way too. I'm not on Twitter yet, so don't, don't contact me that way. <laughs> oh my goodness. So what questions does anybody have? Is, well, I appreciated being with you and thanks for um, being with me on my first Zoom class. Thank you for directing the traffic. I felt safe up in the air, up in the Zoom air with you, Daniel. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank yeah. you, Wendy, uh, for your wonderful presentation and for your time, of course. Um, also, thank you all for joining us. This workshop uh, has been recorded, if you didn't know that, um, and will be posted in Canvas uh, for you all to watch if you need a refresher, if you want to look at uh, something that you didn't get time to catch. Um, and that should be up by the end of the next week, hopefully. Um, so if you have any questions, 
can always contact me at daniel.westerland at unco.edu or you can email gscd at unco.edu if I'm not in the office. Um, someone will be able to respond to that general email. Um, so is there any last minute questions or comments that I can answer right now? Um, I'll give you a couple of minute, a minute to answer. If not, I'm gonna go ahead and end this meeting. It's been a pleasure. So let's see. Thank you, everyone. I enjoyed it. Okay. Um, thank you, Wendy, again. And I hope you all have a great rest of your Thursday and a great